declared that the coronavirus presents a public health emergency in the United States. The New question is, is, just is the radical question, left. Will you shut up, man? Listen. American cities from Seattle to Washington, D.C. burned as many peaceful protests during the day turned to rioting and destruction by night. mental illness crisis as millions face isolation, poverty, and anxiety. Uh, basically, we uh, are doing is preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. Nearly 2,900 people yesterday alone died of the coronavirus. Do the math, that's one every 30 seconds or so. guys. If you got a Bible, and I hope you do, open with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 is where we're going to be at this morning as we uh, plow on toward Christmas. While you're turning there, go ahead and keep turning. I'm going to uh, open us up in prayer, and then we'll dive right in, okay? Dear God, thank you so much for this day. Lord, I pray that over the next few minutes you would focus my heart on your word, and I pray that your Holy Spirit will come amongst us right now. And let um, every word that's spoken be yours, and let every word that's heard be um, yours, and let us um, leave here a little bit more in love with you than when we came, dear God, so that we might um, just understand this Christmas, um, what it is you want to do in our lives and in the world around us, Lord. So please do that now, Uh, Lord, do what only you can do in your people for the glory of your name, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so if you were here last week, um, I told you guys it was probably the most depressing Christmas message you've ever heard, right? Uh, What we tried to do last week was understand biblically why the world is in the state that it's in, right? So why is the world so broken? And now the answer to that, we determined, is that the world is broken because of sin, right? Um, And so last week, we did nothing but look at our issues. Why are we so broken? Why are we so sinful? Uh, And what... and what's going on? Why is the world is the way? It, why is the world the way it is? Uh, basically, we summed up the problem like this: the problem for each and every one of us is that we are sinful people separated from a holy God in a broken world. That's going to be on the screen. The problem for each and every one of us is that we are sinful people separated from a holy God in a broken world. That was basically last week's message. Now, here's what I here's what didn't happen. Nobody came up to me last week after the sermon and was like, "Douse." Can I just tell you I disagree with that sermon? Like, I think the world's fine. I'm not a sinner. We're doing great, right? Every one of us agreed with last week's sermon that the world's broken and we're sinners and we're separated from a holy God. So we, we kind of laid that out as the reason in the first place why we needed Christmas. So this week what we're going to do is we're going to move away from why the world is the way it is to show why Christmas is so important. What we're going to see today is this. Christmas is God offering us a solution to our problem of sin, separation, and brokenness. So so I hope you can kind of see why last week was no, so necessary because we don't get to appreciate the good news of the gospel, the good news of the good message of Christ at Christmas until we understand the reality of how badly we need it, right? So last week was necessary. This week we get to the good news. Now, I want to take a moment here and tie this reality uh, to our Christmas season, okay? So... <laughs> Let me explain to you what I hope happens today. If you are here today and you buy in to what I'm telling you, that Christmas is God offering us a solution to all the brokenness of the world, what should begin to happen in your soul is that the fundamental reality of Christmas for you becomes this good news, this worshipful joy that Christ has come and He has come to deal with our problems. 
that will begin to be the fundamental reality, the overshadowing thing of all of Christmas, as opposed to everything else that competes for your attention each year at Christmas. Now, real quick, all right, this is not an attack on, on Santa Claus or, or whatever, right? Some of y'all are going to be like, well, we've got to find a different church after what I'm about to say, okay? But, I'm going to say it anyway. Sometimes, listen, this is a principle of communication. Sometimes you've got to be provocative to get the attention, okay? There, there are things like Santa Claus, Elf on the Shelf, family, uh, family gatherings, presents for other people that each year become the fundamental reality of why Christmas is so important such that what we begin to miss as all of those other things crowd out the Christmas space is that at Christmas, God himself came to us and offered us a solution to our problem of sin, separation, and brokenness. So what I hope happens today is that as we buy into this good news, and listen, I'm not telling you to quit all those other things, all right? Some of y'all, don't send me that email. Some of y'all are going to send me that email. I can already feel it. Well, you said to stop doing Santa. I, that's, you didn't hear me say that, okay? But what I'm hoping happens is that by the end of this message, the reality of what God has done at Christmas becomes so powerful for, for us that as we leave this place, it takes over what Christmas is. So we've got the bad news. Today we're going to see the good news, okay? So with that said, look with me at Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 5. This is such a, a large portion of text that we're going to break it up as we go today, or else I'd never finish, okay? So Luke uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 5, here's the, uh, what the Bible says. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the di division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Uh, you might want to underline that. that that's going to be important. We're we'll coming back to that. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now, real quick, let me introduce you. Let me give you a little context for what's happening. When we are introduced to a couple named Zechariah and Elizabeth at, at this time period, God is, is literally giving us a message and even who he's going to use. Now, Zechariah was a priest. At this time, there were about 8,000 Levitical priests in the time of Christ, all right? Now, of those 8,000 Levitical priests, there were the most common name for Levitical priest was Zechariah. So here's the point in this, that Zechariah is literally one among thousands to make it even to, for as if God needed to make his point even more Elizabeth is the most common name for priestly wives so in other words what God is telling us is as he chooses to start this Christmas story is that he's using nobodies from nowhere they're normal people you know why that's good for me and you because we are nobodies from nowhere normal people so he's using, he's using normal people. Verse 8. Now while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was trouble, troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. In other words, Zechariah is a human, and he has just come into contact with an angel, his immediate thought is, oh no, right? I'm probably about to die. That's what happens when people see angels. Verse 13, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. If you haven't picked up on who we're talking about here, who this baby's going to be, it's John the Baptist, right? Pretty important figure for the New Testament. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Let's stop and appreciate what the Bible just said. The Bible just said that John the Baptist was filled with his mother with the Holy Spirit from the mother's womb. This is unique in all of history. Let me tell you what the Bible just said, that John the Baptist was born saved. All right? Now let me just introduce you to something. That ain't you. Okay? <laughs> This is, this is John the Baptist, okay? If you don't believe me, ask your parents, okay? The, 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 this idea that John the Baptist is repenting as an infant. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of their fathers to the children 
and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, now I want you to pay real close attention to the question Zechariah is about to answer, ask. How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. All right? I can tell you Elizabeth wasn't in the room when he said this. All right? <laughs> so notice what he just asked. Zechariah has been told something that is improbable but not impossible. Okay? It is not impossible that an old person has a baby. It is improbable. And when the angel tells him something improbable but not impossible, what Zechariah asked for is evidence. How shall I know this? Okay, he's not asking for an explanation. What he wants is proof. How can I know that you're not lying to me? Verse, 20, verse 19. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. In other words, you're really questioning me? And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. So, Zechariah, you wanted a sign? Here's your sign. For the next 12 months, you're not going to be able to talk, right? I can only imagine that this is God in his infinite wisdom, knowing that, Zech that Elizabeth was going to be more attracted to Zechariah if he couldn't talk, okay? That's the only thing I can figure. Verse 21, husbands, there's a tip there. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized what he had seen in a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when this time of service was ended, he went to his home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach among people. All right, first thing I want us to see. So Christmas is this proof that God himself has promised to deal with our problems. As we walk through this story, I want us, I want us to see how this applies to the, to the first Christmas and to our Christmas. Okay, Here's the first thing I want us to see. Christmas is proof that God has not forgotten us. Christmas is proof that God has not forgotten us. Let me give you a little bit of social and personal context for this text. At this time, it had been 400 years since the Israelites had had a prophet from God speak God's word, okay? So in other words, now put this in historical context, America has not even been around for 300 years, okay? So longer than America has been a nation, the people of God have not heard from God. God's been silent for 400 years. It is not without, with, with, we don't have to have much imagination to think that at this point, the people of God are probably beginning to question, has God forgotten us? We know this because most of us cannot go 40 days without assuming that we're Job, right? That God's forgotten us, everything's fallen off the trails, right? It's been 400 years. Now to top that off, they're living in this time under Roman persecution, which means they're being persecuted because as Jewish people, they refuse to serve any God but the one true God, and the Romans wanted them to worship both their God and Caesar. So the Jews at this point have every right as a human being, as sinful humans, to wonder, has God forgotten about us? And now this is even amplified in the case of Zechariah and Elizabeth, who I told you are one, are, are one couple amongst other thousands just like them, that they, they are uh, serving God, they are doing what God has told them to do, and in the midst of their obedience, here's what we're told about, told about them. They're barren. They can't have a baby. Now, why is this so important? Because Zechariah and Elizabeth had been living their life to the best of their ability, following God, trying to do the things God had told them to. And even in that, even in the midst of their obedience, here's what they find. In a broken world, they're still experiencing pain. Now, I love how Scripture clarifies things for us because in this time, what you would assume and what the people around Zechariah and Elizabeth no doubt assumed is that their barrenness was a result of their own sin. And this, in this time period, barrenness was, looked at, was viewed as, upon as a curse that either you or your husband had done something to prevent being pregnant. But I love how Scripture informs us about what's going on. Look with me again at verse 6. I told you this was important. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. In other words, the pain that they were experiencing in this broken world was not because of their own mistakes and their own sinfulness. 
This is a super important point for us to understand because a lot of times what we think in this, as we go through this broken world, as we go through this sinful world, is that if I'm experiencing pain, if I'm experiencing trouble, it must be a result of the fact that God is mad at me. And here's what Zechariah and Elizabeth are trying to prove to us. That God, that sometimes in a broken world, no one is to blame for the pain we experience. It's just life in a broken world. It's hard. It's not necessarily that God's mad at you. It's that you're living in a broken world. And sometimes here, listen to me, there's just not a reason why. The world's broken. And God may understand it, but you definitely don't. It would be easy, and the reason why this is so important is because as we live, go through life and we, we experience these pains, it's not, maybe not even any fault of our own, it's so easy in these situations to think that God has forgotten us. Right? It, it, it doesn't, think about Zechariah and Elizabeth. They've been living their life in obedience to God for as long as they can remember, and here's the one, they, they want a baby so bad and God's not delivering them. Can you only imagine what they're thinking? Well, God must not care. But in the midst of this, Zechariah and Elizabeth stand as a testimony that Christmas is proof that God's not forgotten us. Because look what the angel says to John. Verse 13 to Zechariah. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. So in other words, the angel comes and says, Your, your prayer has been heard. Well, what's he been praying for? Obviously, he's been praying for a, a child, a son. Here's the whole point. And that even in the midst of your greatest pain, your greatest trouble, your greatest season of despair in this broken world, God has not forgotten you. And you may be, you may be here today and you may feel forgotten. It may be barrenness. Listen, there, I, I don't pretend to, to be so naive to think that there are not women in this room right now who are barren and want to have a baby and cannot. And you're, you're here thinking and you thought to yourself, as God has forgotten me. Zechariah and Elizabeth, Christmas stands as proof that God has not forgotten you. And it, it extends far past this, whatever your pain is this morning. It may be job loss, it may be financial issues, it may be marital strife, it may be sickness, it may be addiction, it may be failure. Whatever it feels like, it may feel like God has forgotten you. But here's what I can promise you, that God has not forgotten you. And He may not act on your schedule, He may not act according to your calendar, but He has not forgotten where you are and what you need. Personally, we saw the greatest illustration of this in our life over this past year. Jenna went from uh, uh, July of 2019 to almost July of 2020 without a job, right? And so we literally prayed over and over again. God, show us what you want us to do. God, tell us what you want us to do. And uh, uh, without belaboring the point, I should probably stop using my wife as illustrations, but she hasn't got mad at me yet, so I'm not going to stop until she gets mad. Uh, today might be the day. I'll let you know. Um, <laughs> But without belaboring the point, we went through re rejection after rejection after rejection. I remember there was one night, and I'll never forget this night as long as we live. It was probably a defining point in our marriage and our life going forward. But there was, we had just gotten a, a last rejection call on the job that, I, that she had set her heart on. That we, were, we were thinking this is going to be it. And I remember I, I came home, and now some of y'all don't know my wife. If my wife's ever crying, it ain't good for nobody, right? Like, I don't know, some of y'all wife like cry at Hallmark movies. My wife ain't crying at Hallmark movies, right? My wife's throwing shoes at Hallmark movies, all right? If she's crying, it's bad for everybody. And I walked in, and she was trying not to cry, and I was like, please, God, don't let her cry. Don't let her cry, right? And, 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 and she told me, I'll never forget what she told me. She said, I feel like in this moment we've done what God told us to do and he's not keeping up his end of the bargain and can I tell you as a husband all I could look at her and say is I think you're right like I feel like you're right it feels like God's not keeping up his end of the bargain and, and to be honest the only thing we could rely on for 12 months was this simple fact God has not forgotten us and guess what he proves every time that even in the midst of our deepest pain our deepest hurt we're just like Zechariah and Elizabeth that he may not act on our timetable but he has not forgotten where we are and what we need so Christmas is this proof we see this story of Zechariah and Elizabeth that Christmas is proof that God has not forgotten us but this is not it Christmas is also proof that God has come to do the impossible let's keep reading verse 26 in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man who was, whose name was Joseph in the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, I want to stop right here and point out something to you extremely important. Two times 
in, both, in the first two designators of who Mary is, God has referred to her as, as something, a virgin. Now, that, that, that's exceptionally important. If God repeats it twice, we need to take note of it, okay? But we're going to come back to that. But here's what I, here's what I want to just say at the beginning. That word means now what that word meant then, okay? That word, that definition has not changed. We live in a world that tries to question things like this doctrine. We're going to look at it in just a minute. But it means what you think it means. If you don't know what it means, Larry Rockwell's email is lrockwell at firstbaptistcentralseville.org. He, he's a great teacher. He'll love to tell you. Okay? And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this me might be. I love the, the, this, the Bible's just honesty when it says that he, she tried to discern what kind of meeting this may be. It, honestly, what it reminds me of is like Ari, uh, Ariel. That, that's a princess who my daughter watches all the time. <laughs> Mary took an Ambien, right? It's like Mary was like going to sleep and she took an ambient and she woke up and she's having some crazy dreams, right? And she's like, well, this is obviously not right, right? Those of you who laughed are those who take ambient and you know what happens, right? My mama would kill you if, I, if she knew I told you this. She came to our house one night, took an ambient, ate a whole thing of banana pudding in my fridge while she was asleep, okay? Ambient makes you do some crazy stuff. That's, that's, what, that's what, like Mary is like, they're trying to discern what kind of meeting this may be. She's honestly like thinking to herself, right? Like she's troubled by this. Am I, am I hallucinating? Can I say you probably would too, right? You'd probably be like, well, I've lost it. My husband was right. I've gone off the deep end, right? That's what's happening. And here's what the angel says. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. Now, I want you to underline that phrase, Most High, Son of the Most High. It's going to be really important in just a second. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, all right? Now, you remember the last time somebody questioned an angel what happened to him, right? Zechariah couldn't talk for 12 months. Now, notice what happens here. Mary said to the angel, how would this be since I am a virgin? Now, notice what happened. Zechariah was told something improbable and asked for evidence, and he got rebuked. Mary is told something impossible and asked for explanation, okay? So the difference is, is that Zechariah is told something improbable, and obviously he doesn't believe. Mary is told something impossible, and she's like, okay, but how, right? And can I just tell you, that's a good question, right? The Bible has told us three times she's a virgin. The angel comes to her and says, you're going to have a baby, and she, she has the same question that every other one of us would have. Okay, but how? Verse 35, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age is also conceived. And this is the sixth month with her whom, is called, whom was called bearing. Verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed for her. All right, real quick here. So God is, Christmas is proof that God's not forgotten us. Christmas is also proof that God has come to us to do the impossible. Now, there are two impossibilities here that I think we have to, in order to actually understand what Christmas is all about, we have to understand. Two impossibilities, okay? If you're taking notes, the first impossibility is the impossibility of the incarnation. In other words, it's the impossibility of this idea that God himself could come to us. All right? That's what the incarnation means, that God comes to us. So look with me at verse 32. I told you to underline this phrase. This phrase, he will be called son of the most high. Now the angel here uses a, a title that only refers into the Old Testament of God when his personal name is Yahweh. Now, the, the, if you, you may not know that. This is, this is kind of deep. I need you to stay with me for a second. The name of Yahweh is the personal name of God. Okay, That's, that, that, that is God's name, Yahweh. It means I am that I am. Now, the reason this is such a big deal is because in Jewish times, or even Jews to this day, will not speak the name of God because as sinful people, they will not speak God's name because His name is holy, and the worst thing you can do to defame it is speak it. Now, you may, He may even kill you if He's not really happy with you. 
right? So understand what's happened. When the angel comes and says, the son of the most high, in other words, you will have a child who is the son of Yahweh. You will have Yahweh in your womb. What's happening is the angels come and saying, the God of the Old Testament, the God of Jacob, the God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the God of Joseph is coming to you, and he's going to be in your womb, Yahweh in your womb, is what he's just told her. Now, we are so inoculated and, and invested in a modern world, and we take Christian doctrine so lightly, that this, what I've just told you, didn't take your breath away. When Mary heard it, when the angel said to her, Yahweh will be in your womb, here's what I can promise you she did. She was searching for breath. Because this idea is impossible. This idea that the God of the universe, the God who created it all, the God who is so holy, so pure, and so good, could possibly come to earth, much less be in her womb, she, she doesn't have a category for this. As a matter of fact, what I want you to understand is that there is no religion in the world that has a category for this. Every other religion, philosophy, worldview, every other system assumes... That if we as human beings, y'all, y'all follow me with this, are going to make it to God, it's going to be by us climbing our way up to God. Because there's no way God would ever stoop down. Can I tell you that if you go into a Muslim country and you tell them that God has become a man, they'll probably stone you. Because this idea that God would defame himself, it's unheard of. It's, it's impossible. It's illogical. It's inconsistent. And yet the angel has said to her, he said to her, Yahweh's going to be in your womb. It should take our breath away. Let me illustrate it for you like this. In 1961, the Russians, the Soviets, I guess at that time, were the first people to put a man into space. And after that, Nikita Khrushchev, who was the Soviet premier, made an announcement to the world. And here's what he said. He said, we have been into space, we have been into the heavens, and what we have found is that God is not there. In other words, he was assuming, just like every other worldview assumes, that if we're ever going to make it to God, that it's going to be by us climbing up the ladder to Him. You see, what it is, is this assumes that we are like God, that if we just try hard enough, if we just try to be a good enough person, if we accomplish enough, it's what I call the Babel mentality, right? Anybody remember what happened at the Tower of Babel? The people came together and they said, we will make a great name for ourselves and we will build a tower into the sky and then we will be like God. See, that's what every other worldview assumes, that if we're going to get to God, it's going to be through our own effort. And he said, we've been to heaven and we've been into the heavens and God's not there. C.S. Lewis responded to him by saying this. Now, this is, this is deep. I want you to think about it with me for a second, though. If there is a God, we will not find him by going into the air, C.S. Lewis said. God would not relate to human beings the way a man on the second floor relates to a man on the first floor. See, he said, he said, he's not like us. It's not like he's just up there on the second floor. Maybe we can get to him. He said, it's not how it works. He would relate to us, Lewis said, the way Shakespeare relates to Hamlet. Some of y'all are from South Georgia like me. Y'all are like, what's well, Hamlet? All right, don't worry about it. You'll, we'll get there in a minute. She, he would relate to us the way Shakespeare relates to Hamlet. Shakespeare is the creator of Hamlet's world and of Hamlet himself. Hamlet can know Shakespeare only if the author reveals information about him in the play. In other words, God is so different than us. He's so big, he's so powerful, that the only way we are ever going to know God is if he comes to us. This is the message of Christmas, guys, that at the garden we ran from God and at Christmas God runs to us. I love what Tim Keller says about this. The claim of Christmas is infinitely more wonderful than that. God did not merely write us information about himself. He wrote himself into the drama of history. He came into our world as Jesus Christ to save us and to die for us. This is what Christmas is. That though we would have never made it, though we can go to the heavens and God won't be there, God will leave the heavens and come to us. So that's the first impossibility. 
The second impossibility, though, is not only that God would come, but that God would come to us the way he did through the virgin birth. So I told you that two times when God identifies Mary, he identifies her as a virgin. Now, this is really important, okay? Because the truth of the matter is, the idea of the virgin birth is the most attacked, especially in recent days, evangel- evangelical doctrine in recent history. Like the, this idea, that, like even say it with me, guys, the virgin birth. You know what that is? Inconsistent, paradoxical, oxymoronic, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work. As a matter of fact, I, when I was at Georgia Southern, I had a liberal uh, Christian studies professor. And I remember going to his class, and he was, he was a super nice guy. He, I don't think he, he meant harm, but I remember every time this was brought up in his class, he would look at people like me, he would look at people like oh, there's me around the room, and he would say, if you believe that God, that God came to the earth through a virgin birth, that there was ever a such thing as a virgin birth, he would look at us and say, that is illogical, that is inconsistent, and that is impossible. And here's the thing, guys. I took three classes with him. I took three years worth of classes with him. I could never tell him he was wrong. You want to know why? Because the idea that Jesus Christ came through a virgin is illogical, inconsistent, and impossible. Until you're dealing with a God who says, nothing's impossible for me. And now you might be wondering, like, Dallas, why is this even such a big deal? Guys, this is a huge deal. I, we have, theology changes the way we live our lives. It's a big deal, and here's why. Because if Jesus has a dad out there somewhere, whether it's Joseph or whether his name's Bill or Larry or whatever, if Jesus has a dad out there somewhere, here's what that means. He's fully human and no part God. Now here's what we've discovered all the way back in Genesis 3, that a man can't save us. A man's what's got us into this mess. Maybe a woman, but that's another argument for another day, right? Um, a man's not helping us here. What we need is a God. And so if God, if Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, he is both fully human and fully God, and he alone is capable of saving us. This is a big deal. Now, you might be asking, where does this apply to our lives? Okay, let me, let me th- throw it to you this way, okay? You might be here today, and you might feel like you're facing the impossible. But just think about this with me. If God is the God who has come to do the impossible such that he's wanting to come to earth and dwell with us through human flesh and he's wanting to be born of a virgin, what is it in your life that could possibly scare him? Some of y'all are like, man, Dallas, you just don't know my marital issues, right? I've got some marital issues and they're bad. Can I tell you, God's not up in heaven like, well, you know, I did the whole virgin birth thing, but y'all two, y'all been arguing too much, Right? Some of you, Dallas, I, I don't have a job. You know, I figured out the whole incarnation and how to be 100% God and 100% man, but your job situation, you're right. That's what's going to stump me. If God's the God of impossible, here's what we know. He can do whatever's impossible in our lives just like he already has done. He's already done the impossible to save us, which brings me to the last point. I can't close without this point. Last point is this. Christmas is proof that God always had a plan. Now, if you remember last week, we closed with this promise of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Everybody remember that? That the seed of a woman will crush the head of Satan, or the head of the snake, and even as the head of the snake bruises the heel of the man, right? You remember, everybody remember this? If you remember this, this is a promise in Genesis 3, 15, and I told you guys very clearly that this is a fight, right? It's a fight between the seed of the woman and the snake, right? That serpent of old, Revelation tells us, who is Satan. So what we have in in Luke chapters 1 and 2, as Christ comes onto the scene, if if Jesus has been born of a virgin, here's what we have. We have a God who is the seed of of a woman, right? In a manger. And if we're reading the Bible right, here's what we should do. Even as we see the seed of the woman lying in a manger, we should begin to look for the fight that we know is coming. And so we go back and we read through the Gospels, and you know where we find the fight? We find the fight leaving the cradle and going all the way to the cross. And hear me say this, on the cross, Jesus took a blow. The the serpent struck his heel. He died. He lost. The darkness covered the land. The tomb split open. It was a bad day. He lost. But three days later, Christ himself rose from the dead and he crushed the head of Satan. He won the fight. 
So even as we approach Christmas, we don't stop at the manger. We leave the manger and we go find the fight. And here's what we find. That Jesus Christ has come to solve our problem of sin, separation, and brokenness. He's come to do it. This is the greatest reality in all the world. Because here's, the re- here's, here's, what, I, here's what I want you to be thinking about. Who cares about a baby in a manger if he can't give us life? There were thousands of babies born in the mangers during this time period. Right? There were thousands of people who didn't have good places for their babies to be born. Who cares if this is not the seed of a woman who has come to crush the head of our enemy? Who cares about a baby in a manger if he can't forgive sin? Who cares about a baby in a manger if he can't bring us back to God? Christmas is a big deal because the cradle was leading to the cross. And the cross was leading to an empty grave. And the empty grave is leading to a day when he will return again. And at Genesis 1 and 2 will be our reality once more. I'm praying this year that everything else would go to the wayside as what we realize is that the greatest reality in all the world is that at Christmas we may live in a broken world, but God himself has come to deal with our problems. Now, how should we respond to this? There's, there's only one way that people who are truly saved, people who are truly Christians should respond to this, and it's that we should respond like Mary. Here's what Mary said. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Whatever you want, God, however you want it. Here's my honest-to-goodness belief. That our churches are full of people who have yet to comprehend the gospel. Because I, I know that's the truth because I've yet to see the evidence of the people who are wanting to say, whatever you want, Lord. And if this Christmas we'll understand the good news of the, uh, of the Christmas, we'll understand the good news of what Jesus has done, here's what we'll say. Whatever you want, Lord. However you want it. Pray with me. God, thank you so much for this day. God, I pray that you would forgive the foolish ramblings of a man. God, if I said one thing that was not of you, that was not your will, I pray that you would forgive me. God, I pray and I thank you for the reality that in every situation I found my, myself in, in every situation my family has been in, in every situation that I've walked through in life, dear God, one thing has been true, and that is that you have not forgotten me and that you will not forget me, dear God. And that at, at Christmas, Christ was coming to do what only Christ could do. We rejoice, we praise you, we live for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen.